In the last 10 months, the CEPR has published much of the original research into the devastating economic impact of COVID-19 and also a lot of the original policy ideas in response to it. So at the end of 2020, I caught up with two of the people who've made that possible. Beatrice, Charles, welcome. Hello, how are you? Hello, Tim. Now, Beatrice, I'll start with you as president of the CEPR. Um, we've talked to each other quite a lot this way during this year. And the first time that we did one of these interviews, beginning of March, the CEPR had just put out an e-book called Economics in a Time of COVID-19. You'd put that together in just over a week. I checked, and at the time, there were only about... 10,000 cases of COVID-19 outside of China. So how did you know at that time that COVID-19 was going to have the devastating economic impact it has? It's interesting, uh, Tim, you know, in, in a way, I had a bit of a head start because um, at the beginning of uh, 2020, I was living between Switzerland and Singapore. And of course, Singapore is much closer to China. There were regular flights or there were still regular flights at the beginning of the year. And and also, all of Asia has been much, much more uh, alerted to the problems of pandemic because of the SARS um, epidemic. Um, so, so the fact that Ch what happened in China and then very quickly, uh, essentially East Asia shut down. I have a lot of friends who couldn't go back to China um, after Chinese New Year. So that was kind of you know, the early warning uh, sign that something major was happening. Um, by contrast, in the US and in Europe, at the beginning, it was still, the view was still that it was going to remain a Chinese problem. And even when the when the uh, pandemic uh, center, epicenter was in Italy, it still, for some reason, there was this this uh, view, uh, probably hope mostly, that it would, it would, would remain there, that it would be mostly an Italian. Uh, issue. Um, so it was actually a cancelled trip to Tokyo, which uh, gave uh, Richard Baldwin and me both the time and motivation to sit down and 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 uh, put together this this book, which turned out to be. Uh, I, I actually looked at it. Uh, well, it turned out to be quite uh, popular because it was the first of its kind. But um, I, when I actually look back at, at it, just a, 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 an hour ago, I was surprised uh, that we did get uh, quite a number of the things uh, right. I mean, we talk about the supply and demand disruption. We have in there a chapter by Warwick McKibbin and his co-author who have a uh, did a uh, GDP in their worst projection for, for countries' uh, GDP loss uh, for this year, something in the area of minus 8%. That was totally outside the range of what the forecasts were initially in the in the standard in the standard models and the standard modelers so so we get, did get quite a, a number of things right but there are also some things we get uh, got wrong so so we were very concerned uh, that there would be a financial meltdown in the financial sector uh, things that did not happen yeah charles i look back on this ebook as well and there's 14 essays in it you're number 14 in it and at the time you said that the epidemic looks like a giant Rorschach test of governments and societies. What did you mean by that? Well, I meant, you know, Rorschachs are tests that uh, reveal people's deeper personalities. I mean, the specialists can find out. And, uh, and, I, and uh, I, I, I saw that he was going to do the same for individuals, for leaders for societies because uh, everything would be tested so just you know talking about well-known cases uh we've seen um leaders who have true empathy that showed up so uh, especially uh, women leader like uh, jacinda hearn uh, in new zealand or angela merkel in germany they really projected this feeling that they care for their people on the other side, should I mention Trump, uh, who had no clue uh, how devastating it was and suddenly didn't want to deal with something that was uh, shaking his uh, election uh, prospects. And <laughs> he paid a heavy price. And his great friend uh, in Brazil, Bolsonaro. So we could see, we could see in, uh, in other countries, uh, 
you see Bor Boris Johnson flip flopping all the time, uh, depending on uh, on where he can stand, uh, looking uh, semi serious. In France, you had Macron who uh, went on TV and made great philosophical speeches uh, that were related to COVID, but most people didn't get it. Uh, then you have individuals, I mean, individuals, what I've been shocked is to see how business people uh, have fought to keep carrying the business, even though it's dangerous. So the bars and restaurants, I understand these people are desperate, but then how can they fight to get people to come and get infected? And then around me, around my people I know or I know less, people who take precautions, people who don't take precautions, you see what, what's going on in the mind of these people. And it's been, it's been remarkable and I must say uh, pretty depressing. Yes. Uh, Beatrice, this uh, ebook that we published in March, I, I mean, that was just the first step in publishing original covid research and that quickly led on to covid economics what gave you the idea for publishing covid economics and, and why did you think it would work the first thing we did is actually was a call uh, to the cpr network uh, to really <clears throat> and and an offer to put the resources of the network at the this platform at the disposal of the network in order to be uh, to be able to disseminate and to bring <clears throat> to bring policy advice to um, to policymakers who were really need this was this was a new situation and therefore what first happened is that Voxy uh, U we, we we made a, a special page on COVID economics uh, on Voxy U and that one exploded. Uh, but a few months later, it became obvious that there was a need for, for deeper analysis, uh, for research, for modeling, um, for integrating epidemiologist uh, models with macroeconomic models. Um, for uh, first data was becoming available, real time uh, data. And it, it, and it was clear that, again, we needed some vessel for, for disseminating uh, this research uh, quickly. And so the idea uh, was born to do something that is typical in uh, in medicine, namely uh, preprints. And in a way, um, in a way, the Russian paper series are similar, but we wanted uh, something that is more prominent, which has the look of a journal, and which, uh, which is, however, real time. And uh, then, fortunately, Charles Viploch uh, agreed to uh, <laughs> to basically spend all of this time in uh, in in, in uh, putting together COVID economics, but it's uh, it's fair to say, Charles, that we were surprised about the number of uh, submissions uh, that that you got almost immediately, uh, and it is uh, it is incredible uh, that you were able to handle them. And we were actually that you and the the, the um, editorial board was able to live up to the promise of real time, essentially real time publication. Uh, uh, vetting in in, uh, in in 48 hours or less um, yeah so so uh, so it was it was there was a need there was a need and we were fortunately able to satisfy it how difficult has it been to be the editor Charles <laughs> uh, well it was a tsunami as uh, as Beatrice said uh, within a couple of days of announcing the operation uh, I was getting 10 to 12 submissions per day per day. Uh, and of course, since it was global, uh, it was 24 hours. Uh, when it, any time I looked at my email, there was something coming from another continent. Uh, and uh, I, I had to read quickly the papers, so read 10, 12 papers. Then I had to find somebody to review it. So we, we had a board of uh, editors. We started with a large board, like 25, 30 people. And within a week, we had to extend it because I couldn't call peop upon people uh, every two days to uh, to uh, review a paper within 20, 48 hours. So it was just brutal, brutal, uh, totally fascinating uh, because uh, I mean, the, the first papers were clearly the more innovative because everything, nearly everything had to be invented. There was a very uh, limited literature on the on epidemics. So there were new ideas, new techniques, new uh, data that were coming up daily. 
uh, and and uh, the world was changing in front of my eyes in the world of economics. I was changing in front of my eyes, and it was it was wonderful. What I must also say, um, when we discussed the editorial board, we quickly realized we had to have people from all fields of economics, not just micro macro, but all subfields. Uh, and and that's exactly what happened uh, from the very beginning. We had people with very diverse background, very diverse specializations. They were all using their own uh, tools uh, to look at the same phenomenon, asking different questions. And it was incredibly rich. And still, it's still the case, I must say. Uh, but the easy picking uh, happened early. Yeah, I, I mean, COVID economics has carried on publishing. Uh, I mean, you've been averaging more than one issue a week over this time. And for those of us that try and keep up with the research, it has been both a, an excitement and sometimes quite a task to keep up with it all. So for both of you, I want to ask you, is there anything in all these hundreds of papers, what really stands out for you as a, a piece of research that you saw and thought, that is extremely interesting. Beatrice, you go first. Well, you know, the, the, the field has grown very uh, quickly, very large. And what there are so many very interesting things that you can analyze now. In fact, now that there is data around, and you have in fact, uh, you know, cited or, or, or highlighted quite a number of them in your Vox talks, uh, which are, which are uh, individual, um, individual uh, uh, deep analysis of, uh, of an interesting problem. Like, for instance, does COVID lead to more babies or less? <laughs> uh, you know, your, one of your uh, uh, Vox talks, but but you know what I what I feel is that despite all of this research, uh, we still we still have a problem in answering some of the most basic questions uh, that policymakers are asking, namely, what is the exact health wealth trade off, um, and how should it be described, and what follows from it, and the truth is that in for for the between the first and the second wave and the possible third wave, these trade-offs uh, have changed. And it, it will take time to really uh, expose, assess what the real uh, health uh, wealth trade-off was. So, so in that sense, I think the, the, there is still very, very important questions to be answered, but that they, they cannot be answered right now because they will take, uh, we, we will need more data for that. I, th I think what Beatrice is saying, Charles, is you can't stop publishing it yet. But from this year, Charles, what stands out for you? Oh, there are so many things that uh, that happen. We're starting from nearly scratch. Uh, so what the first thing that happened is that economists took over these uh, epidemiological models, which which resemble economic models, uh, amazingly in an amazing way. So and they changed it uh, to introduce economics, to introduce policies to introduce people's behavior uh, and that and I think that uh, b before they was I mean the epidemiologists have done very very fancy things but they never introduced what governments should do and what people would do in reaction so we learned a lot for example we learned that people um, uh, were likely to uh, lock themselves down before given the order because they were scared uh, so that's that came pretty early. Uh, Beatrice talked about the uh, uh, the trade-off between uh, what has been what's called in the literature health versus wealth, which is really an economic activity. It took <coughs> less than two weeks for paper after paper after paper saying there is no lot uh, no trade-off. You have to people will isolate themselves anyway, so you better organize it and provide resources. Uh, what is also amazing is how quickly data came. Now, within two weeks, people had gotten data from the big, you know, the GAFA, uh, the mean GAFA. They, they, they know exactly where you go every day, uh, minute by minute. And they shared this data with researchers uh, anonymously. And, and extremely quickly, we could see how people stopped moving and stayed at home even before, as I said, uh, the uh, the orders so the validating theories that that's been amazing. We had very early on also data on consumption, 
coming from credit card companies in different financial institutions. And we could see not only consumption shrinking, but what people were consuming and what were not consuming. And that, that became known within uh, two or three weeks. That's amazing. Then pretty early, we also discovered that people were getting really depressed. Uh, we had a, a wonderful paper uh, looking at what music people uh, were listening and they were looking uh, no, at the listening nostalgic music we discovered a uh, helpline for uh, people suicidal people they blew up and all this data became available and became uh, analyzed i mean god there are so many things uh, that have uh, been uh, forthcoming and very quickly uh, there was also a great paper about uh, price gouging on uh, amazon and, and the like where uh, 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 the paper looks at prices increasing amazingly on a few items on some websites, but not on others. So, I mean, I don't know so many things. I do remember the particularly the uh, paper about uh, music and how people are listening to more nostalgic music because I did a Vox talk on it and I went back and looked at my listening history because I was thinking, that's not true. And for me, it certainly was. Um, Beatrice, uh, you also have been involved in coordinating the policy response to COVID-19. And there has been a very large policy response. But uh, while you were involved in putting all of that together, how much consensus and unanimity was there amongst policymakers? Well, what was remarkable about this crisis in the first place is how much policymakers reached out to, uh, to economists and, and of course, uh, medical experts, um, uh, you know, both informally um, at the European level, different ministries in different countries, also more formally forming science task force, etc. So I was, I was uh, actually, I still am involved in quite a number of those. Um, and, and on the one hand side, there was a remarkable consensus about what needed to be done in the first wave. And there was almost a bit, uh, a, a very productive uh, discussion about what is first, a best practice, both in terms of the medical response, but even more importantly, of course, for us, the economics groups, uh, what, is the, what is the right response in terms of economic policy to buffer the impact on incomes to provide liquidity, the discussion about how the liquidity should be provided to firms, uh, how much solvency or liquidity assistance is necessary. Um, and, and, and again, uh, this, although the discourses were largely national, at least initially, rather than European, um, they, they were quite similar. And there was a lot of learning from, from looking at what other countries were doing during the first wave. Now, the second wave is a bit different. Why is the second wave different? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, why countries that did very well in the first wave are not doing so well in this one? Switzerland uh, uh, being an example. Um, it's, uh, it's probably to do with the fact that a lot of the political capital uh, was exhausted. Um, after the first wave and political and social and some people also think fiscal which is which is not the case because a uh, country like Switzerland does have the fiscal resources to to to, to support again uh, but uh, but uh, the, the the governance in in many countries is quite different in the second wave uh, the same true same is true for Germany it's a much more it's a more, much more decentralized governance in the first wave and it has been difficult to rally uh, these decentralized units uh, um, and to respond uh, um, quickly. Charles, the, one of the main aims of the CEPR is that the research that the Network of Economists does feeds into the policy discussion and influences it. In this crisis, have you seen the impact of all the research that's been coming into your inbox influencing the policy discussions that you see how the you see policymakers are having now? My uh, my long long experience with uh, moving from economic research to policy implication is that you never know. Uh, we've been putting up a lot of stuff uh, and. Uh, we suspect that uh, 
professionals in, in government sectors got aware of that, but they have the tradition uh, all over the world to not acknowledge. So I think they digest the information uh, and then they, they do their, their own games. Uh, so it's impossible uh, to know. Um, it's the same with the media. Uh, very often the media tell a very nice story, but oops, they forget to, to say where it comes from. So I've seen, uh, I've seen media articles, I've seen decisions that clearly match uh, or doesn't match uh, what we have, but uh, the, 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 the precision of the link, uh, and that's not only in this case, it's, it's very, very hard uh, to determine. Well, let me ask you this in another way, Charles. Um, one of the interesting interviews that I was able to do this year was with Diane Coyle, and we were discussing whether this crisis is a, a redemption of sorts for the economics profession, which was heavily criticised after the global crisis after 2008. Do you think that in some ways the economics profession has come back into the the center of those policy discussions? Diane Cole, since you mentioned her, has an article that I asked her to write for us where she says economics from villains to heroes. Uh, I mean, what, what has been amazing is how economists from every field, literally every field, immediately dropped everything they were doing and started to produce research. Now, most of them, I, I mean, again, I don't know what their inner thinking, but most of them clearly wanted to be helpful. Uh, they wanted to use their knowledge to improve our understanding. Uh, and they just dropped, they dropped everything they were doing. So I think within a few months, the profession has learned enormously and has shared enormously. And that's where COVID economics and the initial idea uh, of, uh, of Beatrice and uh, Richard to have a free online <clears throat> real-time <clears throat> uh, presentation of the papers. Uh, that's, I think that's a great contribution from the profession. And I keep receiving uh, messages from economists uh, precisely on that saying, thank you, uh, you made it possible for us to sort of talk to, to, to the rest of the world and, and try to be helpful. Whether they were helpful or not depends on whether they were uh, listened to your previous question, but certainly, certainly a huge number of people from all parts of the fields and from all over the world, young and very fa or very famous people, uh, they all joined in, uh, in, uh, in, in trying to do something because they understood that knowledge of something very new, totally uh, uh, dramatic, uh, this knowledge would have a great benefit to society. I have no doubt about that. Yes, we're, we're at the end of the year now, so it's inevitable we look back a little bit. And so for both of you, I'd like to finish off by asking you what the economics profession has learned about itself and how it does research and how it publishes research and how it influences debate from this crisis. Beatrice, what do you think? First of all, I share the, the, the view of Charles that the economics profession has responded in an amazing manner. I'm, I'm actually quite proud uh, to, to look at how uh, the, you know, our profession has responded and and even more so how uh, CEPR was able to, to actually act as a platform for, for making this, uh, this output available, for you know, creating new products on the fly. Um, and and, and we, we have expanded our, not only our uh, uh, output, but also our reach uh, globally. We have more than doubled it uh, within this year. Which means again, there is the there is a demand there for for quality uh, research and policy um, policy uh, papers. Um, what what have we learned and what will what will remain? Certainly, from the COVID economics experience, I think one of the things that will remain is the is the knowledge that it is possible um, to do a quality outlet to have a quality outlet. Uh, 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 with a with a vetting system um, in a very short with a sh very short turnaround, so this is a huge difference, of course, from the way that we traditionally publish uh, in in our 
in economics. And I think uh, some of the lessons of this will carry over beyond uh, COVID and pandemic uh, economics. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, we are not through um, yet. <laughs> this, uh, uh, we are now hopeful looking uh, into the next year, but it's still going to be, uh, it's still going to be a hard time. Um, and the question is, how does it, uh, uh, what are the long-term implications? There is still a large need both for research about this. We have quite a number of uh, issues that may be in front of us from questions of debt sustainability, uh, when to withdraw fiscal stimulus, uh, what are the prospects, not only in macroeconomic terms, but for for firms that, that have, uh, uh, you know, that, that may have uh, debt burdens are no longer no longer sustainable um so so it's uh, it it's, it remains a challenging uh, environment and i think uh, we cannot uh, we cannot be uh, we, we we cannot although we now should take a break for christmas <laughs> but next year i think we have to be back uh, back on the battlefront and 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 help those who are having to make the decisions yeah last word charles I pretty much agree with Beatrice. Uh, in a way, we have changed the way uh, we publish. Uh, up until last, uh, it was normal to wait six months, a year, two years for a paper to go out. Here, the average time between submission and publication uh, has been one week. Uh, so there was the urgency, but there was also an idea that it is possible. Now, of course, our papers are not refereed. We, we call it vetted. Namely, there is a quick look uh, by a referee, a reviewer, and by me uh, to make sure the paper is correct and innovative and helpful. Uh, so it's a very uh, limited amount of expertise on the paper. But looking back, I mean, when I started, I was scared of uh, publishing bad papers and missing good papers. I'm sure there are some weak papers that have gone through. Uh, I know I've missed a few papers, wrong judgment by the reviewer, by me, but by and large, uh, you can quickly determine whether paper is useful or not. Now, it's not referring, so a normal review would not be uh, satisfied with that. And there is no give and take with the authors. We just accept or reject, so it's, it's brutal. But uh, what I, I, I was amazed is that when you ask reviewer to react within 48 hours, they do. And when you ref referee for regular review, they say, can you send us your, your uh, referee report within six months? And usually after an, a year, you get a gentle reminder saying, uh, by the way, where is your referee report? So there is, there is something wrong uh, with the process. But I must say, and, and Beatrice uh, knows that extremely well, we contacted the major reviews. Uh, 2025 20, review, the, the top of the reviews, and we asked them if they would accept papers that we put up as working papers, would they accept to have them submitted to them? So in a way we were competition, uh, although we are not a, a truly refereed review, 100% of these reviews said, fine, we'll, we'll look at the papers that you have put up. So that was also an understanding, and that's where, again, like, like uh, Beatrice, I'm proud of the profession, there was an understanding by the leading, well-established, more than 100-year-old reviews that when something dramatic like uh, COVID happened, uh, you have to move your, from your comfort zone. Uh, so that's also uh, very, very interesting, and, uh, and I feel a bit optimistic. Plus, people are getting used to what we do, so I get a lot of people saying, wow, never happened in my life to have a, a, a report within 24 hours. I have even some people who say, your reports are more informative and better than those that I get after waiting for a year, so, so on and so forth. Now, now everything happens, but clearly, uh, we are at one end of the spectrum, and it's not a model for a regular review. But the one or two years delay uh, is not a model uh, either. And I think that people, and I know people within regular reviews, have been uh, reacting to that and thinking, and, and they already have been uh, speeding up. So that's, that, I think, will change a bit the way the profession works. 
for the better. Well, as Beatrice says, next year we go again. So uh, thank you very much for now. I hope you're getting a few days off at the end of the year, both of you. But thank you for doing this today. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for watching in 2020. We'll be back in 2021, still publishing new research on the impact of COVID-19 and the policy response to it. And remember, COVID economics, our e-books and our podcasts are free and open access at cepr.org and at foxeu.